Hey, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it might be where you are. Welcome back to the live stream. My name is Jeff Fritz. Today is February 21st, 2019. We're not going to write any code today. I've got a guest joining us, and I think this is going to be really interesting because this is... This is going to be continuing in this series that we're doing to kind of learn what we can do to be better technologists, grow our software careers. And I'm going to bring on Matt Veloso, our guest today. There we go. Hey, Matt, thanks so much for joining us. Hello. Thank you for having me here. So uh, why don't you give folks a quick introduction, who you are, what you do? Uh, so I work at Microsoft. Uh, my job title is technical advisor. I'm the technical advisor to the CEO. Uh, and previously, I was the technical advisor to the CTO. So I'm getting a hang on this being a technical advisor thing. Okay, so that's that's really cool. That sounds that that sounds like a lot of responsibility. The technical advisor. What exactly is a technical advisor? You're not right. I'm I'm not thinking of you know the the advisor you see always in the movies the the guy whispering into into the uh gosh i'm i'm thinking worm tongue in in lord of the rings right oh master you should be no no you're you're do more some little <laughs> bit more than that uh it so microsoft so let's uh try to explain this the way i usually explain when 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 folks talk to me here um uh, Microsoft has a few technical advisors. Mm -hmm. uh, usually that role is created by some executive who needs some help. And that what that help means, what that job means varies a lot. So if you talk to different people at Microsoft who have that job title, uh, what each one of us do is very different. Mm. So, okay. for example, the technical advisor for Alex Kipman is basically a chief of staff. That's actually his what he does. He's a chief of staff. So, uh, and, and we know Alex Kipman because he's he's the guy we always see at the big events demoing the Hololens. Yeah, all that all that magic stuff. Yeah. Okay. And so, if you look, for example, Harry Shum, our EVP uh, in Microsoft Research. Uh, he had a technical advisor, Yutin, who, among other things, he created what we call today the cognitive services. We used to call them Project Oxford. So he basically owned a bunch of products that he incubated and he helped release. And now he actually owns the thing and drives that. Mm. Uh, okay. So basically what happens is the executives say, hey, I need help with this thing. And they craft a role for that. Right, and they find the right person they feel like you can do the thing for them, and so, so that's sort of, in a way, it's kind of like a, a different way of saying it's a PM, it's a program manager. At Microsoft, you have so many different kinds of PMs, right, and that's sort of how it goes. So these folks have an expertise in one area, and they bring in an advisor to help in other areas that they want to learn more about and be able to get that that information handed off to them. Right, and even in Microsoft, okay. if we look at our my predecessors, people who have been technical advisors, mm -hmm. the CEO, uh, each one of us are very different. They, we have very different backgrounds. So my predecessor, mm -hmm. okay. Jamie, she's a researcher. She's a professor. She has a PhD, uh, mm, very wow. strong academic background. Now she's a chief scientist for office. Like I'm not an academic at all. That's not my thing. Uh, before her, we had Hoop. Hoop is an engineer. He's more kind of like similar background as I have. Uh, so you see like the different people come to this role. They contribute in different ways, right? And they move on because the other thing about being a technical advisor is you, you, you get to do that for a while and then you mm. move on. It's not a thing where like you build a career doing that forever. Like it doesn't happen. Yeah, Lee in the chat room suggests, is it a transient role? Do you you have a, a number of folks come through. And... Yes, that's that's exactly right. Um, okay. It's uh, for a whole bunch of reasons, uh, from work-life balance to you know career development to how much influence you have, uh, and it's also beneficial to those folks to have people with different backgrounds and different points of view so they don't get too biased towards one point of view. So for all those reasons, you don't want people to stay on this road forever. 
Sure, sure. And uh, welcome everybody in the chat room. I want to make sure that you know we are we are keeping an eye there. We are going to grab yep. some questions and make sure that, that we talk about them. But we want to, uh, Matt, I, I want to make sure that we talk about, since you do have, have a little bit of influence on folks that really set a direction for a bit of our industry, some of the interesting things that you're seeing out there that might help us as software developers, as folks that are beginners and intermediates that want to grow our career and make sure we're pointed in the right direction and, and you know, kind of get us going, learning on those things. And, and the first thing that I know is very important, I've, I've seen on your Twitter, we've got to make sure we talk about, because it is a very important thing to learn about, USB-powered sneakers. Oh, man, that's the future. That's the future. <laughs> Yeah. It's the future, right? So yeah. is this is this IoT gone gone wrong, running amok? Yeah, you know, that's that's so funny that we're talking about it. Um I I'm a, I ride motorcycles, right? So today I took my motorcycle to work. Um and one thing I have is this, let me show you that. Um I have this jacket. Uh, it's pretty heavy, right? Mm, okay. And this is, I joke, that is an intelligent edge jacket because what happens is when you put it on, uh, you connect these little uh, thingies and okay. the jacket turns on like silly lens. Like it's blinking, blinking, blinking. Oh, right? wow. Okay. So inside this jacket, you have a firmware that right now is set up for street riding, but it can set it up for, you know, uh, racing. And oh. so when it turns on, it has a bunch of sensors, accelerometer, a bunch of those things. And the goal is it's trying to detect if you're crashing. Oh. And if it triggers that, it says, oh, this guy's crashing right now. There are two compressed air cylinders inside this jacket, and they go off, and the whole jacket becomes a airbag. Oh, and wow. Okay. Kind of to protect you, right? So there you go. Like, that's that's... Intelligent Edge, that's IoT happening in a wearable device right. to keep, keep me alive, right? And, and it's funny because at the same time, I have another jacket that does the same thing, but it has no IoT whatsoever. All you do is you tie the jacket to your motorcycle. So if you fall, that, that little fetter goes off. Okay. It's completely mechanic, but, but it does exactly the same thing. And you ask me, like... Which one do I trust more? Like, do I trust the one that like it's just this thing tethered to the bike, and if I sure. fall, like I know it's exactly what's going to happen. Versus this one, like I don't know who wrote this firmware. I don't know right. how much tests they did. Right, so like uh, I don't know. But uh, I think it's the it is the future, and it is the future because um, uh, computing is getting so powerful and so cheap that that it, you're going to see that anywhere. And whether it's sneakers that can auto tie and then have Android compatibility issues, and good luck with that. Uh, but yeah. I mean, that, that's a trend, right? It's the, the trend is. We'll, I think so, I, I was watching. I think it was Ray Ozzy. Okay. Ray Ozzy was talking about you know what we had in the past as you know one PC in every desk, uh, one PC in every home, right? He believes that the future will be, you know, you're going to have so many IP, IPs in your home that you won't even be able to track them anymore because they're going to be so common. Like your, your coffee maker is going to have an IP device, your, your wearable device, your sneakers, right? All these yes. things are connected. It's, so that's, that's definitely happening. And, and I hope we sort out the Android compatibility issues because <laughs> I, I want all that stuff, right? So, so uh, a few follow-up questions. Hugo has a, a couple qu good questions here. Um, is the jacket inter internet connected to report the crash? That'd be great to be able to notify medical officials, right? So that help can be sent out if there so was the something jacket, like that. The jacket is not. Uh, okay. That's an interesting thing. Like, it would be interesting to... Like it's it's it has a battery, like so you have to charge it and last for so many hours. And mm. uh, what it does, it does have something that's kind of like a black box. So what they tell you is, if you have an accident, and and what you should do is you switch it off because it can only record so many minutes, mm. and then you send it to them so they can review the data and they can train better models out of it, right? So for okay. let's say you had an accident that the jacket doesn't go off, for example. 
that's exactly the case where you like assume you survive, right? You're yeah, survive, assuming. Right? <laughs> then, then you send the jacket to them, and they can look at the data and they can improve the models. That's really cool. Now, um, and Hugo follows up. Feels like IoT has become anything that can be programmed. Your toaster, your pressure cooker. So, Hugo, I actually now, Matt, I don't know if you've seen this. Right, there's the instant pot that folks have at home. Right, it's a pressure cooker. You program it to, you know, cook your whatever, chili, chicken, whatever it may be. And um, I have one that hooks up with Bluetooth so that I can, on my phone, see here's the current temperature, here's the current time left. Are we getting carried away with some of these things? Yeah, I have a sous vide. uh, Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. And and the first thing when I took it out of the box and I set it up is he asked me to log on with my Facebook account. I was like, what the hell? What? What am I supposed to do with my Facebook account? I just want to cook some beef here. Jesus Christ. Uh, so, um, yeah, I think we get a little bit carried away. I think every time you see a new a new wave of technologies, you know, you have you have all the hypes, right? Yeah. We, we, we joke at the time about blockchain and, there, God, there's so much hype around blockchain, right? Uh, and then when the hype goes away, then the actual useful things stay and we we evolve them we don't want to have as john galloway in the chat is suggesting we don't want to have too many sneaker firmware updates that sounds (laughs) painful i I update i this jacket i I, i'm always updating the firmware because i want to be safe right so i want okay the latest i connect i literally connect it to my laptop and i download the latest firmware okay that that is very cool i've so my my wife and daughters are very involved in horseback riding, and it feels like there's there's an option there, there's an opportunity for a product for those folks as well, doing something yeah. similar, right? Yeah, yeah, and it, this and this ties to like you know Microsoft keeps talking about the intelligent edge. Mm, okay. And uh, it's funny because if you walk around Microsoft and ask people describe to me what intelligent edge is, you hear completely different explanations right uh because if you are a data scientist and you work in a machine learning team you're going to describe it to me as well intelligent edge is about running machine learning on devices great that's part of it but if you go to the azure folks oh they're going to talk about pub sub and iot hub and all these things are great that's also part of it uh then Somebody will ask, well, what about a Windows laptop? Is that an Edge device or an Xbox? Is that an Edge device? Sure, sure. Uh, yeah, right. By that yeah. definition. So, right. So so basically we're saying, hey, there's, there's this explosion of devices with different chipsets, different operating systems, different computing capabilities. And if it was hard enough for us developers to build a simple app that runs on Android, Windows, and iOS... Good luck with that, because it's going to be like a thousand times harder. And so we need to yeah. figure out yeah. how to actually uh, uh, make that easier and come up with application uh, platforms that actually solve the problem. Because it's not just about the supporting all these devices, all these uh, these modes, right? Like I, I may be building an application that might run on a speaker or a headphone, right? Yes. And, now it's just audio, and how do I build the user interfaces that work across these things? Um, so, yeah. Yeah. So, um, and, and I want to answer, there's a couple of good questions here in the chat room and comments. Um, Svava, hey Svava, she comments, updating your wardrobe has new meaning. Yes, it does. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You know... You know, funny story, like when I hang this jacket in my closet, yeah. uh, I hang it close to the power outlet because then I can connect the USB Bluetooth and connect to the thing, right? So that actually, so it can charge. So yeah, my wardrobe is getting a remodel. Oh, wow. Me. That That is interesting. My my wife has a, um, has a sweatshirt that she wears when she goes out riding in the winter that has a battery pack because it's got, it's got uh, cables in it and it keeps her warm. It heats right. the sweatshirt. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't, yeah. it, it doesn't internet connect. And there was a comment earlier about, you know, um, I think it was Ancient Coder mentioned, some of these things don't need to connect to the internet, but they can be self-contained systems that you plug into a, a laptop or something and then either synchronize or update firmware. Makes sense. Right. In some cases, you don't want to connect 
on the internet, right? For a bunch of reasons, you want a device to just not have exposed connections unless you plug it. Uh, I think about this jacket, for example, if uh, I'm at 60 miles an hour and some hacker figures out how to connect to it and make it go off, like and cause an accident, like there's things yeah. like you, you, don't, you don't even want it to be online, to be honest, right? We saw that with, um, I forget which car manufacturer it was, and it's probably better that I don't remember, that folks were able to connect in remotely and and access car systems while the car vehicle was in motion. That's a problem. Yeah, there is like, you know, if you look at how these car systems work, like my Mazda, I drive a Miata, right? And there is a whole forum showing how to hack the whole thing. Apparently, most of the entertainment system is HTML and JavaScript. So basically, okay. if you have a USB stick, you can do a lot of stuff. And really, they talk about reprogramming some things, like even like the speed limit for which how, like if you want to open the roof, uh, there is a speed limit. You cannot go too fast to do mm. it. Apparently, by just messing with those files, you can change that speed limit and things like that. So, like, there's mm -hmm. a whole forum of people discussing, like, oh, I found this thing. Like, if you do this and change, uh, so he raises all these questions, like, about safety, about security, about you know what can and can't you do. Yeah, I I appreciate being able to use HTML and JavaScript to be able to enhance the way my my entertainment system works. I want to make it look cool, bring my own custom graphics. Maybe I've got a theme or a brand. I can buy that. I don't know about being able to change some of those safety features. That worries me. Yeah, it's um, and and I I'll be honest, I never tested it. I don't want to mess my car, but it's uh, it, it raises interesting questions. Like if you think cars are big mobile devices and they're becoming platforms and uh, car companies are putting intelligent assistants and running Spotify and running a bunch of stuff. Um, so, so then suddenly you start worrying about the same things you worry about when you use your phone and you know, about, yeah. you know, so you, uh, you want at the same time, I want a car that gets updated. I want to get the latest apps. So sure. want, you know, and how do you balance that with all these other concerns? Mm -hmm. um, let's see. There was another question I wanted to make sure I touched on. If folks are trying to identify the different models of cars and the various things going on. Yeah. Um, yeah uh, most smart devices will use the phone. A tech preacher says we'll use the phone or some other gateway to connect to the Internet. Yes, absolutely. Right. They connect out using some other device. They don't typically have some sort of a wireless chip or 3G chip on there so they can connect out on wireless. This is changing though. Uh, I think if we're gonna see more and more cars coming with, you know, connectivity by default for like, okay. it may not even like, it may be just for telemetry. It may be even like, for example, uh, Chevy has, you know, you can buy your car, you can buy an internet plan with it. So it comes with their own 4G hotspot in it. And I think as we evolve, the technology, every generation of cars, they come with more computing, more. Mm. Uh, it's going to be a, I think there will be a point where they just have connectivity. You don't even, you know, have a say about it. I, I was always impressed with General Motors with the OnStar technology they had a few years ago. I, I had a, uh, I had a Pontiac at the time and it knew when I got into an accident. There was a, yeah. immediately, hey, do we need to send emergency assistance and these types of things. That, that was different type of connectivity that wasn't necessarily internet but they knew that a problem happened yeah i remember i i used to have a chevy bolt and and one day i think the the battery was there was a problem with the battery so the car wouldn't turn on it wouldn't even unlock the doors i had to use the actual physical key to do it right physical and key what are, what I was like, oh, I'm, I mean, come on, seriously? <laughs> so, yeah. So, I walk into the car and was like, God, and they, I didn't didn't click me, the problem was the battery. So, there was this little button you press, and suddenly you hear this voice, oh, hello, how can I help you? So, well, you know, I'm stuck in my car and it doesn't turn on. Like, oh, you have this little thing on there. Like, and then she she walked me through, like, there was this, this customer service. She walked me, like, oh, open this little lid here. There's this little plug there. You do this thing and this thing. And then she managed to help me turn the car on, right? There wow. was there. I was like, what the hell? So, so uh, 
all of that because the car had built-in connectivity, has mm. a customer service built on top of it. So it completely changes the experience, right? And I had a friend with a Jaguar, and I, I, I don't remember exactly what he was trying to do. If it was open the window or something like super simple. And he tried this customer service, and the person from the customer service could remotely open his window or something like that, right? Uh, mm. so, so you can imagine this, the, like... It, it's a whole different experience. It is. Uh, then our uh, our friend in the chat room, Rex Havoc, says, "Who uses a physical key anymore? What are we, uh, savages? Yeah. Oh my yeah. gosh! Yeah, <laughs> my children aren't going to use physical keys to get into their cars. My gosh! So yeah, even motorcycles, you know, most motorcycles are still using physical keys, but there are some models right now. Same thing. I cannot think about buying another motorcycle, but there, there, uh, some of them already going with a keyless uh, option as well. Mm, okay, that now that <clears throat> that feels a little strange to me. When I'm when I'm using when, when I'm in an automobile, right? I can okay. Uh, there's a there's a door. I can physically, you know, I'm separated from ignition. But a motorcycle. I mean, you're literally sitting there looking right down at it. Yeah, yeah. It, it you know. It's similar to the problem with the sneaker, right? We we start becoming dependent on so many technologies that need to work just so you can walk into your car and turn it on, right? Yeah. It's like uh, so many things that can break. And But I think at the same time, uh, you start being able to uh, do things like test things in scale, you know, build more reliability, uh, do even A-B tests, Right. Uh, imagine A/B testing yeah. a car. How do you A/B test a car? That's a good. That's a very good question. Well, it's like you know. Let Let's think about uh, office, right? Office client, the office okay. that you actually install on your computer. Like you, you can't, you can't A/B test a product that you have to like. I cannot make you install a new version every day, right? No. But there are lots of things you can do that come from the cloud. Like we, we can tweak things and say like, what if like a, the web browser is another great example. Like there are lots of behaviors you can change by tweaking variables in the cloud without having to deploy an entire new thing. And then we can learn a lot. Like, oh, you know, if you do this thing, users like it more. Like what to do that? So you can be very agile. Uh, so you can take that analogy, apply to the car, right? Uh -huh, and okay. say, like, you know, there are a bunch of tweaks you can do uh, that allow you to experiment a lot, right? That's, yeah, as long as you do it safely and doesn't yeah. annoy your user and like, you know, there's a bunch of things you have to keep in, uh, in mind, but, but you can improve experiences dramatically if you do that. Yeah. I think Tesla is an example where they play a lot with these things, right? Oh, absolutely. And... Um... I think Gumshoe Noir has a has a good question here um, about a lack of security in IoT in the Internet of Things space in the trade rags and blogs. Yet when I try to secure my app, I'm finding few resources to take his app to the next level of security. So, I, isn't that that's something that we're trying to address a little bit, isn't it? Absolutely. So, uh, security and privacy. I think those are are. Very important things. So first of all, uh, if you are building IoT, like my personal opinion, you should go for platforms built by companies that are not in the business of selling your data, uh, because yeah. then it gets hard to actually, you know, it's a it's a conflict of interest there. Uh, but the second thing is is when you're working with uh, security in IoT, it all should, it, typically in all debates I've been, it comes down to hey. At the end of the day, I have access to the device. I can do whatever I want. I can update the code. I can, you know, tamper the thing, and there's nothing you can do about it. And then we have to jump one level deeper and say, what can you do at the harder level mm. to stop that happening, right? And that's where Azure Sphere comes up. Azure Sphere is 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 our uh, story for helping addressing that thing where you cannot tamper that device, and we make sure that. Uh, even software updates are secure uh, and they are reliable. Uh, so so I, I think when it comes to IoT, and sure, I mean, then we have Azure IoT Edge where we make sure the connections are secure and we, you know, but but we can go all the way to the harder level to make sure things are not being messed with. Yeah, right. And and I like I like the point you made right up at the top about when you when you have a device. Or, or right, this IoT technology, and it's being produced for you by somebody, some organization who specializes 
in advertising, in in some of these things that aren't where you're the product, your data is their product, it becomes a bit of a challenge to separate those two and say, well, wait a sec. Am I properly getting something here that is that, that is going to be private to me or are they going to sell my data? And then you have to you end up looking through those end user license agreements. Oh, we'll make sure that some of this stuff isn't shared. And and I don't know about you, but I get paranoid about the, the little hockey puck speaker that sits in my kitchen that I can ask, um, you know, what's the weather going to be tomorrow? And, and those, the, those virtual assistant devices, I get worried that the microphone just turns on and who knows what it's picking up. Yeah, I mean, the, the example that I had with like my cooking device that tells me to log on on Facebook. And yeah. Like, what the, you know, uh, sure, I get I get the value of, let me just log you on to this thing with the lowest friction, I don't need to create a user account. Beautiful, I, I think uh, Facebook has done a great job in, in enabling this sort of scenario um, that I think it's, it's really great. But then it raises all the questions, right? Because now those folks have an access token to my, you know, uh, Facebook account, and what exactly I'm consenting to? Like, can they read my email? Like, maybe I don't want them to. Like, now they can tell when I'm turning that thing on and off based on my email, mm. and, and have a log of that. And I don't even know if that's being logged somewhere. Um, so, so suddenly things are going out of control very quickly, right? I, yeah. I don't control that data anymore. So um, what we can learn from that as developers, if you are going to integrate with some of these other services and you are going to request permission to those things, only request those things that you need access to. If you're letting somebody log in with Facebook, well, maybe you only need their, their email address and name and maybe their profile pic if you want to show that somewhere on screen. But be, be clear exactly what it is you're using because it is great and it is convenient to, to build a service, build a device that does integrate with some place that I already am and have a presence at. But do I really need Facebook to to be able to use my uh, pressure cooker? I don't know. Uh, yeah, I know. And every now and then, go to the, the top providers, right? Uh, Google, Facebook, Microsoft. Go, go to all of them and review all the apps you have consented to, right? Oh, just, my gosh, just yes. Just look at, you know... Every mm -hmm. now and then, because it's scary, like you, you lose track of, you know, how much stuff you gave access to, to your things. And, and every now and then I just go there and just randomly delete stuff, right, just for the sake of it. That's a good tip. To make sure that, that they don't have unnecessary access. Clean out some of those. And you'll see them on, on Twitter and Facebook as integrations or applications in your profile. Um, and it, there was a, somebody else made a comment. I think it was Hugo made a comment about something will happen where you have a provider that is working with these IoT devices. They'll cut support, and now you've got a nice shiny bubble that doesn't do anything. God, I, yeah, I have I have so many of those devices at home. <laughs> you know, uh, let's not talk about Windows Phone right now because it's probably not a good thing. But you know, uh, it, it it's. It, it's a difficult balance because we have to enable companies to try things, yeah. right? There's startups, like there's so many startups, like they, I, I hope they succeed and I buy their stuff, like and and sometimes they don't. And like, well, you know, it was a good try. It was we had the fun ride there, and, mm -hmm. work, and um, we we shouldn't punish them for trying, right? And, no. and maybe the business model didn't work, and well, that's life, and let's move on. There's a there's a lot more failures in business than there are successes. Yeah. So. Yep. Yeah, I still have a few zooms at home. Uh, I still love them. I, I have a Zoom HD that I haven't powered on in several years, but I've I, I found it a couple of weeks ago and was like, oh. I love the thing. That was that was a nice device, but. Yeah. Yeah. I will. Um. Keeping an eye, there are a lot of a lot of things happening over in chat, and I want to make sure that that I make sh that we uh, capture some of this. Lee says, "I love Zune." <laughs> yeah. um, escrow uh, Hugo has an interesting question. Maybe escrow the service code or firmware so that people can extend things, keep keep other IoT devices in service. I, I would think that sounds like an interesting idea. Donate yeah, to yeah. an open source foundation or something so that it can be maintained. Maybe. Yeah, that's not a bad idea. 
it's like some sort of exit route. Like if you realize the product's not going anywhere, at least give it to the community and let them like, I, yeah, I, I'm right there with you. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, DevLead has a, has an interesting point. Going back to some of those integrations with services like, like Twitter, Facebook, Google, Microsoft, the, um, Azure SQL has a security feature with anomaly detection. So if you've accessed the database from a location, geographic, location that hasn't been accessed before triggers an email would be nice if those token issuers would notify if a token started to perform actions that it hasn't before so uh, i know i get this when i log in with facebook somewhere like i logged into facebook on a plane and they're like oh you haven't logged in from here before validate but if facebook sees that all of a sudden a an integration starts doing a new action you start reading additional things out of my profile send an email that might be interesting yeah we we did that like azure sql is one of the many examples where we did that we do this all over azure we do this all over office on office for example i can even protect the user from themselves like for example i i can do things like let's say you you're sending an email to some phishing scam where you're putting your credit mm. card information there and we can have a rule set up that says whoops sorry you can't don't no credit card on emails, don't do that. It's a bad idea, and here's why, right? So we can block these things. Uh, the jail location versus logon thing, like it's a typical problem that we all had when we're traveling worldwide doing presentations. Like uh, John Galloway, who works with you and I, we, we had this problem a few times where we package some demo on Azure, and we travel over the world, and we do that demo in different places. And then suddenly Azure sees, whoa, hang on, the same users being logging in from Europe and from Brazil. No, that can't be right. I'll block you guys, right? So, oh, okay. so <laughs> we have to kind of prepare for those things because it's the AI trying to keep us safe, right? But but it's overall, there are many things we do in the space where we cross signals from different places and try to detect this kind of anomaly to say, hey, something is weird here. We should do something about it. Yeah. The, it, it's... it's it feels like common sense types of things that, that a service provider should be able to pick up on, right? It's just a matter of does it make sense for them to do, to build those types of things. So, yeah. Um, yeah. And I see some comments about Python in there. I want to... Python's an, an, an interesting topic, and I know a lot of folks are really getting into Python. And I've... I've I hope you don't mind. I, I want to just read your your current pinned tweet on your on Twitter because I think it's great. Um, <laughs> if you check out Matt's Twitter, it says, uh, difference between machine learning and AI. If it's written in Python, it's probably machine learning. If it's written in PowerPoint, it's probably AI. Now, now yep. th th that's, that's funny. PowerPoint, it's not really doing anything. But machine learning written in Python really is a big thing that, that we need to keep up with. Is is Python something that a .NET developer should start checking out to get into, to learn more about machine learning? So I, I'm, like, if you ask me what's my favorite programming language, I'll probably go with C Sharp, because I, I've been... Okay. With, with the, <laughs> I've been there with .NET since version one, right? I, like, right, like, I work with anything from basic to Pascal to a bunch of other stuff. But when .NET came up, I was like, wow, this, this is really cool. And I, I really fell in love with it. And I, I can do JavaScript, I can do TypeScript. And then uh, because I started to be involved with discussions around machine learning, what data scientists do versus what developers do, uh, then I started learning Python myself. Like, And I'm not like, I'm far from being a, a, a Python expert at all. Like any any average Python developer can school me with with the eyes closed, right? Okay. But, but I wanted to get the spirit of like, you know, what's why this language is taking off? What is it that people love about it? And so I had to go and the, the way I do, like if I, I need to learn something is I give myself a real problem and I go try to solve with that, with that thing, right? Because then the real questions come up, like it's not yeah. just... Uh, and then playing with Python, I realized, you know, I, I, I think one of the 
biggest reasons people love it is is not so much the language but the packages like and, and i think okay. there are some really interesting packages uh uh if you talk about for example numpy pandas the way you can massage data like if you think about machine learning like one of the biggest things you're going to be spending a lot of time doing is massaging data right oh yeah it's, it's, Data is never in the way you want it to be, so there's going to be a lot of filtering, reordering, grouping, calculating things, averaging. Uh, and what they did with pandas uh, and NumPy is, is really impressive. Like you can do a lot with very little code. Uh, and Python itself is like you know, people might get offended when I say that, but Python reminds me a lot of Basic, right? It, it does. It, that, it's, it's simple. Yeah, the, the old school basic, the the not visual basic, but old school the procedural. Old school yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. It's it it's got that same type of uh, very direct, very very simple keywords. You're not wrapped up in in object oriented programming. You can use it if you'd like, and it's incredibly flexible. Um, right. People are saying Q basic. Man, I love that thing. Oh God. Ah. <laughs> uh, that brings me memories. <laughs> um, and Daniel Silva says, when I first learned C Sharp in college, I started to hate other languages like Java and JavaScript. I think that's a challenge that a lot of folks have. You learn a primary language, but to break out and to go learn Python or F Sharp or, or Java or, uh, gosh, even, even Swift, it, it's, it, it takes a lot. There, there's that, that mental... Um, lock that you have on this is the way that I think and you're used to it and then to break out into all right I have to start thinking functionally because I'm using F sharp right or how how they go and do that is definitely a challenge that folks need to make sure that they uh, that they cross and that, I think that's part of what makes us better developers is learning that second that third language yeah it's uh, we, yeah I think the same analogy like when, when you compare Java and JavaScript, right? It's not just different languages; are completely different ways of doing things. Mm. And, and so you have to embrace a different mindset. It's like you, you're not, like, for example, with Python. Like one of the things I've learned earlier, like if you're doing a lot of loops, you're probably not doing it right, right? It's, <laughs> it's not the right language for doing a lot of loops. Uh, where in C sharp, like loops all the way and link and all these things. Right? So. Um, you have to think differently. And I think that's the, the beauty of learning this kind of languages. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Uh, DevLead, thank you so much for that cheer. And we'll make a do donation Wait, uh, to Black Girls Code. Matt, we make donations for all of our subscribers and cheers here on the channel to a different charity. And this quarter, we're donating to Black Girls Code. Awesome. Um, awesome. So thank you for those bits, DevLead. And I think it makes a very good point poking fun at me here. Um, data is never in a consistent way. Just check Jeff's cheer comment dates. <laughs> so what I do is I, I take the cheers like, like dev leads there. And when we're writing code, I drop a comment in the middle of whatever code we're writing. And I indicate how, my, how many bits were cheered and uh, who made the cheer, what date it was to show that they supported that block of code. And uh, it's a way to acknowledge them and thank them. Um, and yeah, I've got half dozen different formats I've used number of bits first then then the name or maybe it's the name first and then the bits uh, it's a, it's I wrote a parser in uh, using the Roslyn analyze Roslyn compiler technologies to go and find all these things and I ended up having to massage it three four different ways yeah that was um, that was quite an exercise and eventually we're gonna create a little supporters uh, page so that we can show the folks that have supported our different projects here. Yeah, you know, have you ever heard about the Microsoft uh, Prose framework? No. So there is this thing, let me copy the link here, is Prose uh, stands for Microsoft Program Synthesis Using Examples SDK. Let me copy that. Okay. That's not new, that has been there for a while. Um, the idea is, you know, there are certain things that traditionally we used procedural code to solve. Like, for example, regular expressions, right? You need mm. to transform some text, then you write some gazillion regular expressions and do some data transformation, and that's that's how we've been solving problems for for since ever. 
But Tell you what, let's, with, let me bring that up there. There we can see it above my shoulder. Right. And, but with the rise of, of machine learning, uh, suddenly you start being able to solve the same problems in a different way. And so, for example, what, what's interesting about this particular SDK, and we, we are, we're using these in a variety of Microsoft products, right, is um, you can program by example. So let's say, for example, you have a, a series of strings and you want to, whatever, extract the middle name from, from a list of names, right? Option one is you go read some documentation about regular expression and write a bunch of stuff and you can go do that, right? Option okay. two is saying, here's a bunch of examples of before and after of what I want. Learn from this and generate the, the, the whatever regular expression for me. Right, and that's oh. what this thing does. Okay. Right? So imagine you have an end user who is not a developer, and, yeah. and yeah. you want to enable them to create those rules, and they're not going to be writing regular expressions. No, no, right? the, the non-technical folks. Right, you know when you go to Excel, for example, you start doing these things, Excel gets, oh, I, I got it, I figure out what you're trying to do here, let me keep doing it for yeah. you, right? And that's this kind of thing. Okay, Right. so it's a framework of technologies for programming by examples. Now, I see... Um, a bunch of different technologies here, documentation, solution areas. Does it, and uh, Flash Fill in Excel and PowerShell, is is this all, I see NuGet packages, I guess this is a .NET? Yep, yep, you oh. can see some samples there. Cool. Yeah. Love seeing samples on GitHub. Uh, yeah. Dismiss that. Oh, that's awesome stuff. Yeah. So I think uh, as developers, we, we we have to start being more comfortable with you know uh, using this sort of thing. Like sometimes you know, sure, like you can be a master of regular expressions. I'm not. I I'm proud of mm. not being. <laughs> you know, that's not my thing. Uh, but the idea of you know being more of a teacher of and democratizing AI, I think that's another thing. Like we. Uh, we, we somehow we created this impression that AI is this thing that is mythical that only elite developers can use for anything, right? And everybody else has to suck it up, right? Uh, you look at things like this, anybody can use that in any... Yeah, uh, and, and right? that's, that's something I think um, Level 002 actually points out here is that it's hard to keep up with all the languages. And uh, I'm going to extend that and say with a lot of the language creep, a lot of the feature creep we see around languages and frameworks, and yep. it eventually you, one specializes, and every day there's a new programming language, there's new features, new frameworks. I completely agree, uh, Level 002. You're, you're on to something there. So this yeah. is the demo. That for that yeah. uh, pros SDK to split text, that this looks like like a web web log here with the various get commands that it's getting pages and things. So what does this do when I click split? It, it's figuring out all the various columns for us. It looks like. Yeah. So uh, and then you could define it differently, right? Like so, so log parsing is a typical example where before you can do any machine learning, you have to do a lot of massaging, right? Mm, yeah. Uh, and, and you have a very consistent set of strings, like they follow more or less the same format. In this case, you have an IP address, you have a date, you have... Uh, so you could teach it to do a bunch of things, like not just splitting the values, but you can say, hey, I want this date formatted in different ways. I want this, okay. uh, you know... All, all this is so it's basically uh, just evolving the algorithm. Like basically, behind the scenes, what it's, it's trying to do is is try and error, try and error until it gets the result that you you show, right? And when it gets it, say, okay, now I, I have a model that that does what you ask me to do. Okay, definitely something. And, and some folks in the chat room are saying we should take this for a spin and write some code with it in a future stream. I, Sounds like a pretty neat idea. Yeah, yeah. So now, Janescu points out, we, we also have the ML.NET framework out there that that our uh, our friends in DevDiv have been working on. Yep. What's your, what do you think of that, where that's going? This feels like a technology that is going to give us more machine learning on the edge, greater control over things that we need to build. And some folks were saying, this is actually a little bit a little bit of an extract uh, abstraction over some of the things the Python folks have already built. 
Right, and I think it comes back to your question, like if I'm a .NET developer, should I go learn Python? You know, that that's a big uh, enterprise to go, you know, if, if your day job is working with .NET, are oh, you going yeah. to have the time? And, and, you know, like you have other things going on in your life that you really want to go spend all your energies learning Python. Like I, I, in my job, for example, really, I don't even code anymore, which is freaking me out, like for the last... <laughs> <laughs> two years or so, like I'm not writing any code anymore. Like, I, I don't know. Uh, but so uh, I've learned Python enough so I know what I'm talking about. I know okay. people tell me why they love it. I understand why, what we, how people do things. But if I was in a project where all the code is C-sharp mm -hmm. and we need to add some machine learning, uh, I would probably go with ML.net because, I mean, what's the point and go learn a whole different set of tools and I'm not going to be a great Python developer anyway, so what's the point, right? Sure. Uh, so, so in that sense, I think it, it's great. And, and when I look at some things that .NET has, like, for example, link queries, I think yes. they, they, it, it's beautiful to think about those things with machine learning. Like, they can help a lot, right? So, so I, I think it's a great it's a great thing that we're investing on it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It, it it's it gives us more power on those big machines that we do have locally. But you do have the ability to access the cloud and use some of those standard models as well. So we end up getting great choice, actually. Right. Uh, um, there is a company we acquired uh, not long ago called Loeb. Uh, I don't know if you guys heard of it. But let me put the link here as well okay. uh, very small startup um, we we saw their work and say gee like this these guys are pretty impressive what they did is they built a a drag and drop ui and i'll open a parenthesis here i'm super skeptical of any programming drag and drop ui like i have strong opinions against it because i've seen so many of those things not go anywhere right so Okay. Um, I make that dis disclaimer. But hmm. uh, we saw these guys did, and they basically enabled, you know, uh, deep neural networks like vision models. Like, uh, I, I don't need to be even a developer to build those things. I drag and drop like some computer vision tasks, like, for example, grayscaling an image. That's one step. Then sure. edge detection is another step. Then sure. train some models, right? You can see in their demos how you do that, like, super visually. The beauty of what they did, I, I don't think is even in the drag and drop thing. Like in the drag and drop is, is cool by itself. But, yeah. but, but the beauty is like they demystify what does it take to build a visual model to detect, for example, hand gestures, the one you were just showing there, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, well, you need to take these particular tasks. So, so it's not a black box. I, I'm seeing what's happening like step by step. Now, when I think, uh, when I look at this, I think, you know, we could do exactly the same, but in programming, like the same mm, level of okay. abstraction. Right? You could have those very super basic steps where you say, hey, this is how you grayscale an image. This is how you do edge detection. This is how, like, one line of code for each, do this, do this, do this. In, in a way that you're not just solving the problem for the developer, but you're also kind of helping them get their head around of, you know, What's going on in this mythical AI thingy that, that I'm using here because I'm not a data scientist, right? I think that's the, the, the beauty of what Loeb did. So we hope that we, we're working with them and we, we, we hope to, to come up with some cool ideas out of it. So let me, let me reflect back over to the chat room here. Uh, Perry at Digital Ox says, Pro's SDK looks awesome. I have a project for public health for cleaning up messy address demographics that could there really use this. There yeah. you go. Yeah. Let me, awesome. let's, there you go, Perry. That's great. Um, that'll definitely, that, that kind of thing, when, when I hear that folks take something they've learned here and they figure out how to apply it, right, something they've learned on stream and how to apply it to their job, to whatever task it is they may be working on and simplify things, I tell you, Matt, it, it, that makes me, uh, that, that gets me excited. I'm really happy to hear those kinds of things. What, what I like that I'm seeing about Loeb, and, and maybe this is something that, that can be pushed a little bit further as this technology evolves, it looks and it feels like this is the kind of thing that some of the non-technical folks, and there's, I can see a number of them in the chat room, but some of the non-technical folks that aren't developers, 
that don't know some of these things around, around machine learning and technology. This looks easy to be able to say, well, here's how to detect some of these things and it, so that you end up training that vision AI to be able to recognize and turn a hand gesture into an emote. That looks pretty cool. And if, if that's able to evolve into other use spaces, I think some of the, like I said, some of the non-technical folks that are watching, and I see our friend Quill Tony's now hosting us. Thank you. Um, I mean, right here's somebody who quilts. There's an is there an opportunity for vision AI in the types of things that they do? I don't know. We're just at the at the beginning edge of some of these things, and and to show those people these technologies, my gosh, th there's a whole other world that's going to hit. Well, th think about this way. I think there is a general pattern uh, that we're going to see more and more as developers. Uh, I'm not a data scientist myself, so let's make that clear. Right? Uh, and uh, where you have something generating some raw organic data. For example, uh, IoT devices with cameras and microphones, or even documents, like people creating documents, lots of raw right, stuff. And then you have to use some machine learning to extract uh, valuable information out of it, entities, right? intents, uh, attributes, like yeah. graphs, oh, yeah. uh, that then I, developer, can do something with it, right? I can write rules. If you think about this pattern, right? we'll see a lot of this uh, evolving. So anyway, from, you know, how do we extract entities from a Word document? Like how, from, from like 50 pages of a Word document, how can I extract what it is talking about? Like what's the topic? How does it relate to other topics? Like can I build a graph out of it? So right? when I was in college, we had Cliff's Notes. Right. To be, able to, to, to be able to point something at a Word document and say, okay, here's the professor's data version of the book and generate... AI version of Cliff's Notes, a summary from that is gigantic. Right. So we did a demo. Have you seen the JFK demo we did? I probably not. No. Um, we remember when they released those JFK files, like lots and lots of scan documents. Yes. Right? Oh, uh, so a friend of mine, Corum, uh, he put together Azure Search and a bunch of cognitive services to actually scan those documents, do OCR, do image recognition, like every photo, try to identify what's in the photo, and all of that to build a graph of information, like how these documents relate ah. to each other, like what are they talking about, right? And he built this demo, let me put the link here as well. Okay. Uh, and if you search for build, like there, there is a build demo he does that's super cool, like where he starts finding like correlation between terms, right? It's like, okay. that, it's really like, oh my God, we're finding something interesting here. Maybe this thing happened because of that other thing and so on. Uh, but like extracting knowledge from a bunch of paper documents, right? And, and, and knowledge in the sense that something that I developer can program against, like there's an API, there's mm. a graph there, there are entities, I can actually query them. I can, How things are related, oh my gosh. Right? So uh, that pattern, we're gonna see a lot more of that. We, we're okay. gonna see, you know, uh, it can be, my dream scenario is I would like to put a bunch of cameras in a factory, right? And, and Teach those cameras. This is what it means when somebody, like, let's say it's a food production uh, treadmill, and I don't want people to touch the food with their bare hands. Yes. Right? And I want to teach those cameras what it means. Like, this is the product, right? Okay. This is the person. This is my hands. Am I wearing gloves or not? Right. Am mm. I touching the thing or not? And converting those many images into those signals that I can actually program an event against. Like, if person touches. Food, then do this. I want to program oh that, that language, right? Yes. But to get to that, we need to to do that massaging and, and extracting with machine learning, right? So I think we will we'll see a lot more of those kind of things, right? And democratizing. I think the other thing is we need to use <laughs> machine learning. Uh, go ahead. No, I was going to say it, 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 you're saying about about uh, detecting. What people are doing in in a in a uh, restaurant or somewhere where they're curating, making food. Nick's mad science in the chat room. Teach the cameras when an employee is working at less than ninety five percent productivity. That's a little much, but uh, if they if they contaminate food to be able to identify exactly who it is 
and be able to automatically take whatever steps, that's... Yeah. Yeah. And the other thing is, is using machine learning not as the... We need to be very, very concerned about the ethics of what we're doing with yes. machine learning, right? The, the, not just ethics in terms of privacy and the profiling and racial yeah. profiling, these sort of things, but also ethics in the sense of what, what we're doing to the society. Are, are we using machine learning to replace people, right? Replace jobs? Then, then th that's probably not, you know, a thing we want to. But, but if we're using machine learning to empower people, like if you think of Microsoft's mission, right, to empower people to do more, to achieve more. Yes. Right? Oh my gosh. Yes. That, that's the kind of stuff we want to do. We we, we want to. So you can think about uh, people usually afraid that machine learning is going to replace their jobs and automate everything. Like in a, it doesn't have to be that way, right? It's completely up to us to, you know, make people. Like, most of the scenarios I see machine learning be used are things that humans will never be able to do anyways, right? We're not replacing right. them because their job didn't exist to start from. This correlation right? of 34,000 pages of documentation, nobody is going to study all of that and figure right. out what those connections are. Those well, documents have been there for decades. People didn't yeah. do it, right? So it's not like, you know, you're replacing something there. Yeah. Um, Nick also had a neat idea back here. Let me make sure that I, I reflect back on this. In the chat room, Nick's Mad Science um, had a, had an idea using Loeb, right? Let me get, flip back to Loeb there. If you're able to train it to recognize hand gestures, if you were able to use it, perhaps uh, I use OBS, Open Broadcaster Software, here to control the scenes and the various things that are happening on stream. But if you're able to train it to use sign language, to interact and run the broadcast, that would be pretty impressive because there are there there are WebSocket plugins to this software. Is there a way to connect the dots? Right, it, it, I feel like th these are Lego pieces, and we're and we're figuring out. You know, here's a way to analyze and get this piece of data, and there's that app over there that you can use to do X, Y, and Z, and to snap those together to do that integration. What that if I told you we already did? That exactly thing, like if it, recognizing uh, uh, hand signs and translating those, right? Uh, Microsoft Research has done that using Connect. Let me put the link here. Oh my gosh! Uh, All right. So you can actually do real-time translation. You know, somebody we demoed that. I don't know how many years ago. Where like you can do real-time. Twenty thirteen. Yeah. Nick, there you go. There you go. Uh, and there is, like, you know, there's solid research, like, even with RGB cameras, not depth sensing cameras uh, around this, like, we're getting much better at gesture recognition. Oh, my gosh. Uh, yeah. Again, that's another perfect example of, you know, as a developer, I want the text out of what that person is saying, not, not in the images, right? Because yes. I can do a lot with the images, right? So, so that's the sort of thing. Text becomes data, and then I can use that. So... Uh, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna brag for a second. So we've taken some of the text here on stream, and we we implemented this over the last week or so, and we're using Azure Cognitive Services to take some of the data from the chat room, run it through sentiment analysis, and then this third number that you see here underneath me, that's actually a percentage of happiness, right, from sentiment analysis. The closer to 100%, that number is. The, the happier the sentiment of the chat room. And you can see it's trending up. And that the smiley face is just if it's less than or greater than 50% over the last the, the last message or two that it sent. And the, the 79 right now that you see is just the average over the last, I think it's the last minute. Might be the yeah. last minute or five minute, I forget. But it's yeah. this is stuff that's freely available that I just connected the dots on. Yeah, and, and things like you know, machine learning is, is getting everywhere. Like the, the feature I was playing, like when we tested our Skype connection yesterday, the blur background, like let me do it here. Like, there you go, like my background yeah. is blur, right? Privacy, and then I can, like this is all machine learning, right? Uh, built into Skype. Um, uh, Nick is asking, can you buy new Connect anymore? Uh, so Connect for Azure is, is coming, like we are, which is a more modern version of, like we announced that. Of that device. Yeah, okay. and so so that's coming. It's exactly for developers. The goal is for developers to use it. Yeah. Um, 
it's sentiment analysis. That's right, Janescu. And uh, there, Lennon BR mentions, um, and it, Lennon helped us build the the first prototype for this, and we extended it. We had a couple pull requests here on stream, and together we built that little widget. Now it uses Azure sentiment analysis. We think we might need to to change this, and and this goes in a little bit towards training some of these technologies. We had to train. The, the sign language translator here. When you see folks use emotes, like, like Daniel Silva just did there, we, how do emotes affect sentiment analysis? There's something yeah. a little bit more to that. Yeah, yeah. There is this interesting, uh, when we first launched the, the first generation of cognitive services, we called them Project Oxford, uh, they were all pre-trained models, right? So you have one for vision, for example. I put a photo there and it tells me, oh, I see a dog. Oh, I see a cat. Oh, I see this thing. But very quickly realized that scenarios are, every developer has very particular scenarios. I have a friend in Brazil, he built a diet application. He wanted to take food photos of food. Oh, okay. And, and he wanted machine learning to say, hey, yeah, there is a beef here, there's potatoes, therefore you're eating this many carbs and blah, blah, blah. Right? He, oh, and that's our great. Vision model, wasn't training for that and even if it was like the dishes in brazil are different than the dishes in japan right so you like now we have all this so basically what we realize is what we need is a way for developers to bring their data and train their models without having to be you know freaking data scientists who know everything sure. about it. so the the second generation of these things that we call cognitive services they most of them are trainable Right, the, you, like you look at our vision API, you have the custom vision, we have custom speech, you have custom translator, right? You have custom language. Yes. So all these things are are <clears throat> uh, solutions where you bring your data, you tag, you teach the machine what you want out of it, and it builds the model for you, mm. right? So, so I, I I think that's sort of the the path we want to follow with this sort of scenarios that you're talking about. Like yeah. maybe I want emoticons, right? Maybe I want whatever. Like so so let's bring those. Yeah. Right? We have custom emotes like like Ancient Coder is sharing. I've got Brady the Sloth there as an emote you that folks have on channel. What does the sloth mean? I don't I don't know. <laughs> it's a sloth. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Then, yeah, and the scenarios are different, right? Maybe in this chat the way people use those things is different than the way they use it on Twitter. Right. And yes. so maybe the models are different. No. Oh my gosh. Yes. And oh, Hugo, good point. What's a, what's a gritty, right? The, the, I have gritty, the, uh, the mascot for the NHL Philadelphia Flyers. I've yeah. grabbed a cartoon image of his face. I, I don't know. Um, yeah. but, but training then training these models get right. It gets very interesting. Then when you think about that blur effect you, you showed, the camera needs to be trained and needs to figure out what's the background versus the foreground. Now, uh, I'm kind of cheating because, right, I'm going to go into my configuration here. I kind of cheat here because I have a filter for chroma key and I actually have green behind me. Ah, right, right, right. So, uh, right, I can just tell it, well, go find all the green and delete it and you can see that rough green outline around my chair, a little bit around my head. But when we're talking about the a machine learning algorithm that's figuring out here's the edges of things there's depth that it's calculating there that's interesting well you, there are some these days you can see apps that do amazing things like can change the color of your hair right they can yeah. fix your face and do like you know a bunch of like it, it's these things are evolving so quickly that's scary like and it raises again a bunch of questions about ethics like if i can tweak a video to a way that it's isn't you can't tell the truth from what's fake. That uh, becomes an then issue. Then we have a problem, right? Yeah. yeah. So we all have to be really, really constantly think Microsoft has, has an entire organization that their only job is to think about ethics in the space, right? Mm. And then what what should they, should we not do? Uh, it, it's it's a, an interesting problem. Oh my gosh, yes it is. Uh, let's. I, I want to take a second and say uh, hello to Federico Gonzalez from Ur Uruguay. Thanks so much for joining us, Federico. Appreciate you tuning in. Um, the uh, Skype desktop has the blur background. Yes, just like Teams. Yep. I, I love seeing seeing there you go. seeing these features circulate from one product to the next within the same family, 
at Microsoft so that we're all benefiting, whether we are in Teams, we can still blur the background, or we're, we're in consumer Skype. Now everybody has access to this technology. Right, and if you look at our cognitive services, uh, most of these things are, are there for you, developer, to use as well. Like it's, uh, it's the same group of folks. Like we have one group of people at Microsoft who do everything vision related, vision machine learning. Um, and, and so, so these shows in different places, PowerPoint, they shows in a bunch of different places. Yeah. Um, some folks regarding ethics in, in AI and machine learning, this person does not exist, where they're generating people's faces that don't really exist. That's a little scary. Fake generated uh, uh, voices of, of people, right? We've seen demos where there, there was a generated voice that called a restaurant and ordered takeout. That can get a little scary. Interesting, might be beneficial to, to bridge that digital analog divide but th there's ethical questions that come up there. Yeah, the thing that we all developers, like even if you're not a data scientist, but you're using machine learning, you have to always, always ask the question of like, am I being fair in using this? Like for example, I, I met a developer, he's, uh, he's building a system to try to identify criminals. Like if people are mm. lying, this sort of thing, right? Now, sure, I can use, machine learning, I can collect a bunch of data, like vision data, I can collect sensors in your body, right, and use a bunch of historical data. And I could argue, no, I'm just training with real world data, so what could go wrong, right? Uh... But then you have, like, if you go to a country, and USA is a country where, like, uh, uh, there is a demographic problem where, like, if you go to the jails, most population there are African Americans, like, they, they, mm -hmm. they have they make less money. They struggle more. They're more likely to end up in jail. But it doesn't mean, like, if you're if you just give the real world and train the model, your machine learning will become racist very quickly, right? And suddenly your machine learning thinks that if you're African American, you're more likely to be a criminal. Like, so you have to ask yourself those questions because your AI is not going to ask those questions for you, right? And you have to think: Am I profiling people for the wrong things? You're you're inadvertently injecting your bias into the AI. Yeah, and people argue, oh, but that's just real world data, I'm not doing anything wrong. Yes, you are, because yeah. now now you're reinforcing a thing that, that shouldn't be happening. Like you cannot judge people because of the color of their skin, for example, that's not acceptable. You cannot use that as, a, as an element in your machine learning. Right? Yeah, definitely things that, that we need to stay ethical about. So, yeah. um, and uh, all right, so let's, let's get a little bit lighter here. Let's get away from, from a heavy ethical thing here. And I, I want to talk about, about devices here for a minute. We saw big, big uh, uh, technology announcements yesterday. Phones, I've, we've seen a couple of folks ask about phones there in the chat room. But now, now we're on the edge of the, the Fold phone. And, and Samsung released their Fold phone yesterday. Some other companies, smaller companies, had folding phones at CES this year, the Consumer Electronics Show. What do we think about folding phones? I have strong opinions about it. So let me, let, let me share how I see this. If you think when, when smartphones came up yeah. and how they took off, like they... they you know, they swallowed the, even many scenarios that used to belong to PCs, right? Mm. Suddenly, phones started to take, take over those scenarios. Like, why why do I use a phone instead of a laptop? Like, one, because I can carry it anywhere. Sure. Two, because it takes literally a second to turn it on and do something, right? I can do like, so super quick tasks. Like, I, I, if you look at usage, like, you can see how phones, people use it, I don't know how many hundreds of times a day. Like, you okay. glance at your phone and do something. Like, you don't do that with your laptop. Your laptop, you, like, you put in a desk, you open it, it takes a while. Then you, you know, type. You have to log in. You have so to longer, find the app. Yeah. Yeah, longer scenarios, right? What the phones are not very good at is anything where you need a bigger screen. Yes. Right? That's yes. the thing that they, like, I still bring my laptop around, I still use a tablet, etc. because that, now, the thing that I keep thinking about is, okay, so if I can bring a device in my pocket that is also a big screen device, uh, 
is that going to take even more of the scenarios that would normally use a tablet for? Like, why would they have a tablet? Right. That thing is a tablet, right? Becomes a uh, tablet. Yeah, yeah. Right. Can I attach a physical keyboard to that thing? And then is that kind of a laptop now? You know, so so I, I keep thinking like, are these things going to evolve more and more and become this one device that does everything? My, That's kind of like me. I have this really old phone that I that I break out every now and again just to kind of show off. This is an old pocket PC. It's branded Verizon Wireless. There you can see it, and yep. it, it ran the really old version of Windows CE where it actually had a start button on it, but it had a slide out keyboard. Aha! Uh -huh. Fantastic. When, when I had this device and I saw folks start to go to keyboard on screen, I don't know if you feel this way, Matt, but when I want to be able to see more of the screen because I'm typing an email, I'm typing a text message, I lost half the screen to my keyboard. Right. So, so I saw the tablet, that right, the, the innovation of the iPad and other tablet devices as this is a way for me to get that keyboard and still be able to see more of what's going on on screen. Right. And then like, let's, let me take my, my surface go. Hang on. Sure. Sure. Uh, so if I think about like somebody said, Hey, but it's still easier to type on the laptop, but here's my surface go, right? Super small device, very nice keyboard. The keyboard, yeah. uh, it, it it's pretty good. Like I type on this for hours and I don't have a problem with it. It's I would argue, okay, this is still not pocket size, right? It's sure. still a bit larger. Sure. But how much smaller can a keyboard, like maybe the keyboard can fold, right? There are foldable keyboards out there. They fit on your pocket. They're pretty nice. Uh, so but are you we still have that screen size you got to carry around. Yeah. Yeah, but then now we have foldable screens, right? And they can fold in two, maybe they can fold in three. I don't know. Uh, it feels like we'll, we might be aiming to a point where those things will come in your pocket. Like they're going to be powerful enough. Uh, if you're not, you're going to be, in, we have enough connectivity to stream things from the cloud, anyways. Sure. Right? Yeah, yeah. We're, yeah we are seeing I, that. Yeah, I, my dream scenario is being able to carry one of those phones, open up, and run Visual Studio. And imagine that, like, just start like, oh man, that would be awesome. So that would like, be cool. Yeah, I, I don't think we're far away from that. But um, the the interesting thing about about the folding phone is that crease in the middle, and everybody's it, right. That's the the part that everybody looks at, and and you get. You, you get leery about, right? I worry because if you fold it too much, is it going to snap the display? Great, it's it, it's there. It does a thing right now, but uh, what's going to happen to that? Gosh. Yeah, I I know people are bringing the Windows Phone guys. Like I, you don't need to tell me. Like I have a drawer full of Windows phones <laughs> that I would love to use. Like I, yeah, you don't need to tell me on that. Like I'm there with you. What? It, the, the the thing that made the Windows Phone unique and that I don't think the uh, and what what got such a loyal following and I miss in Android and iOS is that that very tight integration between applications. We have that in Windows and they don't have that in the mobile platforms, whether it's a tablet or the or the popular phone OSs. It's yeah. that tight integration between the various applications just isn't there. And I think that's what I think folks really miss. As much sharing as you can do on iOS or in Android, it's just not there. Great. I can share an emote from Twitch and send it in a text message. That's, it, it's, it's tricky. It's painful. I get it. You know? Yeah. Yeah. We, we, you know, I still, like so many years later, I still look at iOS. I look at Android and I look at Windows Phone and Windows Phone looks so much more modern. Like it, it, it might be my bias, right? But I feel like iOS and Android it looks so old. So, so uh, I've I've got a theory on this, Matt, and, and let me share it with you. And tell me, uh, tell me I'm wrong. In chat room, you probably haven't heard me say this, but let me share this. If you look at an iPhone, if you look at an Android phone, you see a field of apps. You see a field of icons that you click and it opens. That's Windows three one. Yeah. Yeah. And the, I, the, I the scroll. a lot with Windows 95. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, right? This, 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 we've seen this. We've known how to do this for two, three decades. It's, 
It's not new, but it's reliable. And it's interesting to me how how much it emulates Windows 3.1. And when you put apps into a folder together, that's a program group in Program Manager. We've done this. We've seen this. Of course, folks understand and appreciate this. And it's it, it's it's something that I I can definitely appreciate that folks are used to it and they, they understand it and it makes sense. But when we break out of that and we just present a different interface, whether it's the way Windows Phone did it or some other operating system or whatever the next generation is, we're going to have confu- confused folks who are coming from the field of icons that they want to click and launch. Yeah, yeah. There is this this beauty, this simplicity that, that Windows Phone had, and also the developer experience, right? I think when I look at mm. developer experience in building a Windows Phone app uh, compared to Android, compared to iOS, I still like I would I would take Visual Studio any time of the day. Like you know, it's it's so much better. So um, yeah, it, it's like I get people get frustrated, but you know, nobody's more frustrated than than us. us yeah you know and it's like you know we wish the market would give us a shot but they didn't you know we can uh, there's this thing like with some we have this debate i i think another debate that was very similar is the one about edge using chromium right oh that's and, a good question and, okay and a lot of folks saying you guys should have used firefox because we need more diversity great that, that's a fantastic goal Sure. But it's, it's an illusion to think that Microsoft has this power to tell the world, hey, go use this thing. Like, if we had that power, everybody would be using Edge to start from. Like, everybody would be using Windows Phone to start from. We don't have that power. No. Right? And so so it's a hard thing. Like, I, we get for, like, everybody gets frustrated, but we it's not that easy. Yeah. Um, folks are commenting about live tiles and Windows widgets or uh, gadgets, I think they were called in an older version of Windows. Yeah. Right, the, and that was definitely a thing for a while. Being able to see that 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 little dashboard on your life, whether it was on your phone or in your start uh, start screen in Windows 8, and and get that quick information. You know, here's how many emails I have. Here's new photos that have, that arrived in my OneDrive. That that was great, but the market spoke, and folks weren't weren't a fan of those types of things. Yeah. So yeah, it, it, it's a tricky one. Like we. Uh, yeah, we, we, we wish there was like, I remember when I went to one country that, that adopted Windows Phone quite heavily was Portugal. I went to Portugal okay. and I remember there was quite a lot of people using it. There was a moment where I was like, gosh, this thing might actually work. We might actually get there. Mm. But but then there were countries where there was no penetration whatsoever. And, and that was really heartbreaking. Yeah. Um, SQL Mr. Magoo suggests... Um, if if we built what developers would like, then I guess most new developers would like the VI phone. No, no, not the VI phone. That's sorry. How do you exit the VI phone? You can't VI shift phone. ZZ out of that thing. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Forcer says Microsoft has been early a bunch of times like tablets. Yeah, that that's something to to comment on also. Tablets, we were extremely early on, and be, certainly before my time at Microsoft. Um, but but the, the tablet device was a thing in the way early 2000s, late 90s. Yeah, there is a book that I, I finished reading not a long ago and is still here on my desk, uh, Blitzscaling from Mr. Reid Hoffman. Uh, oh, okay. It, let me remove the blur because otherwise it's going to like not like there. There you go. go. Blitzscaling Hoffman. So Reid Hoffman, you know, he is behind little things like LinkedIn, PayPal, a bunch of other stuff, right? Sure. And in, in his book, he talks about this this thing he calls blitz scaling. Like he he basically trying to describe this Silicon Valley spirit of you know building highly successful startups and what are these patterns. And and he talks about you know sure it can be there early on like. But that's not that alone is not the ingredient that's going to make you be the dominant player in the market. And he talks about all these different. It's an interesting book. He talks about you know being able to detect the right signals and there is the right yes. timing. For example, when we were building tablets, the technology wasn't there yet, and those tablets were clunky. 
right? Oh, very. It's not, it's not like iPad kind of technology. Like those are really clunky, yeah, yeah. right? So being able to be at the right time when the technology gets to the point where it can actually do something we couldn't do before uh, uh, and then scale with that, it, it's really hard. Like you, the, the, all the starts need to, to align. It's not easy. And uh, uh, D.D. Walsh in the chat summarizes it very well. The early tablets didn't have an ecosystem. That that right. extensible capability to take that MVP product, that minimum viable product, and say, oh, you know what? I can extend and make it do this also. Build an app that runs with it. Have some hardware that works with it because it's extensible. And you see folks build that ecosystem like it happened with iPhone and the iPad. Then you get folks excited and and it grows and uh, my gosh, Reed Hoffman, I, I've got to find that book and uh, take a look um, because yeah. that, that kind of thing very much interests me. It's interesting. I, I I'm not sure I agree with everything he says, but I think there there are some uh, fascinating sites. Like I mean, the guy has remarkable success track in this space, right? He, he knows mm. a thing or two about making these things work, and, and he has a lot of interesting sites there. Yeah. Uh, Cartoofer points out there were convertible laptops as tablets 13 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. yeah and think about HoloLens versus all these other, you know, uh, virtual reality devices that came later. Like, we, we are often there early. Like, I, I don't think being... Like well, that's not our thing. Like we, we we see these things happening very early. Sometimes we just don't time things uh, accordingly. Yeah. Uh, I, I think um, the the when we talk about Hololens, I mean we're we're what three four years since the announcement. And and I I struggle Matt with with being able to say yes that's a technology I want to go after when there isn't a consumer release. You know, I know yeah. it's penetrated into industry, but right. my my kid wants to play Minecraft on the coffee table, that type of thing. It's like, mm, it's right there, you know. Yeah, I, I think, I, and I'm I, I, I'm not speaking on behalf of the product team by by any means. Like, it would be good if one day you can talk to Kipman or some of the, his folks, but. Uh, HoloLens clearly is not targeting that, that consumer market. It's no. not the device you're going to buy to play games. Like the, the price point is not for that. It's aimed at enterprise. Like we, we, we see enterprise industrial scenarios like, you know, uh, some cool stuff integrated with dynamics, uh, integrated with uh, uh, remote calls and uh, remote presence. Uh, it, it's not and again, like it's not that we don't want it. This is where the market's telling us we want to use it that way. Right? So yeah. That's the kind of scenarios we have that we would like you to help us with. Um, so um, when you look at consumers, like w what I'm seeing a lot of people using is is phones, right? I, I see a lot of people doing augmented reality with iPhones. So they take this, yeah. like the iPhone is actually literally adding a lot of capabilities exactly for this kind of scenario, right? And if I think about it, uh, I'm walking around, uh, like if, let's say I work in real estate. I'm walking around a, a house and I need to take some measurements. Uh, am I likely going to be carrying some headset or am I be carrying like a phone and just put around and just take some measures and then they just move on, right? So, yeah. so it, again, the, the flexibility of this thing being in your pocket, uh, we shouldn't dismiss that, uh, and that might be why those things are more common in the consumer world. Absolutely. Oh my gosh, the the portability of the technology is definitely something that folks um, underestimate. Um, right. Forzer and Smab UK. I, I want to just take a second and and talk about this. The uh, the concept of anti Microsoft sentiment in the community. In, in the tech community, in the product community. I, I feel like that's something that's really turned around in, in, in the last three, four years. Um, folks are seeing the, the open source outreach from Microsoft as an organization, making, making great products that anybody can use and extend. And I think about Visual Studio Code. I think about the direction that .NET has gone with .NET Core and C Sharp with a compiler being completely free and open source for folks to use. Uh, yeah. 
Yeah. Um, it, it's slowly changing. What, what, what are your thoughts around that? Is, is this, I know we hear from some folks that, oh, it's, it's just a game. It's Microsoft just trying to get into your back pocket and then they're gonna, they're gonna pull the wool over your eyes again. Th this is real, right? And, it, yeah, and Smab's it's... right. In the past, there was significant anti-Microsoft sentiment, but it has changed. We're, and we're not pulling the wool over people here. Yeah, they're, they're, well, um, I'll, I'll tell you my opinion, right? Uh, my opinion is Microsoft is, is radically changing our culture internally. When you think about a company that's 100,000 plus employees, that change doesn't happen in a night. Like it's, it, we're talking about people who have been doing the same thing for two decades. And yeah. suddenly we're telling them, hey, you know, you're going to start doing things completely different. They said, what the hell? Like I've been doing this for 20 years and now you're telling me to do differently. So when you say Microsoft's culture, there is not one Microsoft culture. Like you go to different groups at Microsoft, you're going to see very different ways of working. They have different people. They come from different places. Uh, if you... Uh, some of them are younger and they come from startups. Others are, have been here for 20 years and they, you know, have been working on the same things over and over again. Yeah. So, yeah. so changing culture is hard. Like if you see, uh, if you read people like Warren Buffett, he, he says, you know, if I need to depend on, if I'm going to invest in a company and if I need to depend on them changing their culture, I, I might not do it because it's hard. Like, you know, I'm yeah. Oh, yeah. Culture. Right. So um, that culture is changing. And is that is that us trying to play nice so we can uh, win your heart? Uh, yes, as well, because you know what? Like, if you don't play nice, we don't have a chance anymore. Like, in the, we in the world we play right now, we either be the good citizen and, and uh, play along with open source and and be on board with ethical values or everything else or or else we we jeopardize the future of this company like in so many times we have meetings with with important customers we we just came back from a trip from mexico okay where where the government is making a big push to uh drive open source right it's, it's there for a bunch of reasons some ideological some uh, rational, where they say, hey, we want to embrace uh, open source. And, and uh, there we are, Microsoft, and we're hearing from them, hey, we, we appreciate you guys because we see you are, we have been doing a series of things in the name of ethics, in the name of privacy, in the name of openness, that we, we, we can see that, and therefore we want to work with you. So does, does playing nice benefit Microsoft? Of course. Yeah. Uh, does it mean that that's not real? It is real. We are changing that and we worry about it. And thank God we, we have a business model that that doesn't force us to invade your privacy, to sell mm. your data. Right. So we are in a comfortable place to say, hey, if you use Office, we will take our privacy as the most important thing ever. Right. And it, it's our comfort zone. We, so our strengths play together. In oh this yeah, new culture. So, so it's a very comfortable place to be. And, and being nice as an organization isn't something that's limited to just Microsoft. Whatever your company, your your employer might be, if it's if it's a pharmaceutical company, if it's a finance company, a, a cable company, if it's the Department of Forestry, being nice to your customers is a good thing to retain customers. Yeah, and uh, often we see this, um, you know. There is only so much I can tell about what happens internally, but uh, it, it a week doesn't go by when when we don't have discussions about hey, what's our role in in the society, mm. right? Uh, in the future, where if we're not careful, oh, here, here's one thing I can talk openly. Like there's this guy called Jaron Lanier. Uh, let me put his name here so you can research him, Jaron okay. Lanier. Go, go read his books. Go watch his TED Talks. Uh, he's a huge critic of tech companies in general, including Microsoft. And guess what? We hire him. Right? He works here. And he talks about, hey, if you, if you read his books, he says, hey, if you're not careful, uh, we will end up in a world where there will be like five tech companies 
and you either work for them or you don't have a job because they replace all the jobs and they own your data. And if you buy music from them, uh, you good luck with that because that music doesn't belong to you. It belongs to their platform. And if you switch platforms, you don't own anything. Mm. Right. And, and not only that, but they gamify with your data. So because they want to drive engagement from you, they're going to give you news that, that only align with your point of view about the world, right? So they will radicalize you to make you more engaged, right? So he raises all these things in his books, and, and those books are, like, from, from years and years ago. He predicted a lot of the issues we are seeing right now with social networks. Uh, ah, okay. Right? So he, he's quite a visionary. This guy is amazing. Like, he can play a thousand musical instruments, or, you know, he, he, he's a researcher in the mixed reality space. He... He composes soundtracks for movies. Like he, he's a freaking genius. But uh, he's based in California. But he, he raises all these concerns, and and from from people like Jerome, like we have series of initiatives inside of Microsoft. We're asking ourselves, what's our role in society? We don't want to be a company that replaces businesses. We we are not an aggregator. We are not like we're not trying to aggregate everything to a single core. Like we are a platform yeah. company. Sure. Right? And as a platform company, the only way you can grow is by enabling businesses to grow with it, right? So, mm -hmm. so uh, that debate happens a lot internally. So, so I I can't go much deeper in details, but I, I, I think promise you, it's not just appearances. You know, oh, we're nice, right? It's not like we take those things very seriously. Absolutely. Um, Cartufer in the chat says, when Microsoft allows code reviews from the public, I think it'll do better. Take a look, uh, Cartufer, at uh, github.com slash Microsoft, and all of the source code is out there. You're welcome to submit pull requests. You're welcome to review the code and comment and say, hey, this needs to change. We don't agree with this. You need to make this better. And changes have been made to various products based on feedback from the community. So Yeah, it's a process, you know, uh People might ask, uh, usually when I have this conversation, first of all, like Microsoft is the number one contributor to open source in the planet, like my yeah. number of employees, uh, twice as much as the second place, right? And then somebody can say, oh, yeah, but Windows is not open source. You guys are lying. Uh, and again, the company is changing, right? When you say, hey, let's take one of the core businesses we have, like Windows, and let's throw it through the window, yeah, let's open source everything. It's like saying, why Google doesn't make ads free? Like they could make ads free, right? Why not? Sure. Right? It's it, it, it it's not that simple, right? But mm -hmm. uh, uh, you can see how much the company has changed so far, and how much we engage with open source, which we didn't do at all uh, before. So so it's taking time. Yeah. Absolutely. So um, we're we're uh, closing in on the end of uh, our our time here. I've got about 20 minutes left. I want to make sure that I touch on at least two or three more questions. And I want to make sure we end with, I, I, I pulled the, uh, I pulled the viewers and we, we put together, I've got a standard question that I'm asking my guests now when we wrap up here, I want to make sure I get to that. Um, so what is your daily driver machine? So, I mean, certainly Microsoft, we have access to all, all the surfaces, whether it's the old coffee table machine or, or a Surface Pro or Surface Go, I saw you, you shared with us. But what kind of machine are you using on a daily basis? Oh, God. I, I use a combination of, there is a Surface, the one I'm using right now is a Surface Book 2, 15 inches. Yeah. Uh, I have a MacBook here. There's a MacBook. There is a Pixel Book over there. There is a, I've been playing with a remarkable uh, tablet. Uh, Thank you. Thanks to Jesse who convinced me to buy one. <laughs> I have a Surface, Surface Go, Go. As well. All right. So I try to play with a little bit of everything. Same thing with phones, right? I have an Android. I have an iOS. Mm. Like, uh, uh, I switch them around all the time. Uh, so in my job, like if I'm not using a little bit of everything, then then I I I can't know what I'm talking about. So so. So, friends there in the chat room, you, you saw it. He, he uses a Mac. The more you know. Okay. Um, 
<laughs> so, and and th- that is something that that's good to stress is as as developers, as technologists, as we want to start being able to have our stuff work with different platforms, whether it's a website or a mobile app, you need to get out of just one machine and get into some of those other environments. Yeah, and the same thing with with uh, mobile devices, right? Um, I my preference today is on iOS, so the phone I typically use is an iPhone X, mm. uh, but I, I have a, a Pixel as well, and uh, every now and then I, I switch over and I spend some time using the Pixel, uh, comparing what what's happening on each side, which phone is doing better. Uh, you talk about folding phones, I'm seriously considering the the the, the folding one, and, and maybe I'll switch finally to Android. I think one of the benefits with Android is it integrates better with Windows, Okay. Uh, so there's more you can do uh, uh, with Windows, like uh, iOS, because it's so constrained, right? There's only so much you can, so many entry points you can uh, you can mess with. Uh, so uh, I might switch over to Android uh, as my default, uh, depending how things go. And that kind of leads into a, an interesting question that I think our, our friends at Apple ran into over the last year, where the new iPhone X series that they've that they've released, they're, they're devices that cross that thousand dollar barrier yeah. for for Americans to purchase. Um, and then when we look at the new Samsung device, it's almost two thousand. It, it feels like there might be a little bit of a cultural. Um, cultural mind block that folks have on spending that much for a, a pocket computer, um, but you're okay, right? Folks are okay though with spending fifteen hundred, two thousand for a laptop or a tablet. Um, it's an interesting catch twenty two. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm from Brazil, right? Originally, mm-hmm. when I think about somebody mentioned like two thousand dollars for the Samsung. I can't even imagine how much that thing is going to cost in Brazil. And if you think about the average uh, salary, you know, my first job as a developer in Brazil, I, I, I used to be paid what would be today $200 a month. Oh. That was my first salary. Oh, right? my gosh. There was no way in hell I would ever be able to afford something like that. Right. So, so yes, it's an interesting thing where you, you think about, tiers and what's the target audience to what they're trying to to achieve with that yeah yeah all right so i've got i'm i'm gonna go to my final question here because i think there's a little bit to discuss around this and i i know our friends in the chat room are gonna have something to say the final question i'm i'm starting to ask all of my guests are what technologies give you nightmares what keeps you up at night technically that you're worried about that we if we have the uh, the opportunity to fix what should we go after? Uh, I think anything that has to do with where society is going towards, right? Oh, wow. Uh, okay. So so anything around uh, how can we ensure that technology will still provide a dignified way for people to have a job? Mm. And we'll, we'll make sure that they are informed and not 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 gamified towards you know being radicalized politically or whatever you know yes uh, so, so anything where technology is evolving so quickly and and how do we not weaponize it and, and hurt ourselves in the process uh, so so that that is the thing that keeps me awake in the night that's the the one thing I want to make sure that we we do the right thing. Yeah, being ethical in those technologies that we build, make sure that folks still have jobs. That's a that's a very good point. Or I, I think there's also something to be said for helping folks evolve their jobs. Maybe yes. you're not, maybe you're not digging coal out of the coal mine, but now instead you're managing and robots that do that instead. So healthier, you know, breathing whatever in the coal mine, that kind of thing, and you've leveled up and you can produce more coal from the coal mine, that kind of thing. I think there's definitely something to be said for that. But social media being polluted, that's a huge, very, very big topic right now. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. My, I can give an example. My wife is a photographer. Okay. And she, she usually takes photos of real estate and I can see Mm. how technology is, is 
is empowering her so she can do more of what she likes and she's really good at uh, and less what she doesn't like. Like she's not a big fan of spending 10,000 10, 10, hours retouching photos and mm. Photoshop, right? And there's a bunch of technology that helps her with that. Okay. Uh, but she loves to go there to take the photos, to find the right angles and the right light and so on. She doesn't want to replace that part of her job, right? Yeah, yeah. And so, so we want to make sure that technology is helping her on the things she, she needs help and not replacing her. And that, that's the kind of thing that we, we have to think about. Very cool. All right. I'm just going to make sure that we don't have any more questions or any good comments in the chat room that we haven't touched on here uh concepts from science fiction written from before i was born isn't it isn't it curious matt how science fiction has become science reality yeah you know gosh it so much yeah even the bad ones even the scary <laughs> ones right uh, <laughs> from big brother to you know like yeah, yeah. so it's uh we have to be constantly watching for it like it, it, the technology doesn't like it, it, I, I think was which book I was reading was uh, uh, Homo Deus from Harari, okay. where he says, you know, science doesn't give you moral values. No ideology no. gives you moral values. None of those things will tell you right from wrong. That's a thing that you have to find, right, and keep in mind. Science doesn't tell you, yeah, don't build an atomic bomb, right? It's, you know this. <laughs> so, so we have to constantly watch for this. It comes from us. Oh my gosh, it does. It absolutely does come from us. We have to keep an eye on how we can be better at yeah. at advancing society. Um, definitely something to be said for that. Um, and it, I think it's interesting when I was when I was a student um, in college and in high school, um, there was there was a series of books from uh, William Gibson, right? He wrote Neuromancer, coined the term cyberspace. The, some of the ideas around the internet and virtual reality came from him. And I read this great book from him called Virtual Light. And mm -hmm. when I saw the HoloLens announced, that was virtual light. That was the glasses they put on in that book and they were able to see augmented over whatever it was they were looking at, you know, schema information about a, about a bridge mm -hmm. and information about the folks that they were walking around and looking at. There's definitely something to be said for um, the technical folks taking inspiration from science fiction. Perry, we're not going to hack the Gibson. Uh, no. We're <laughs> <laughs> There's also the Magic Leap. Yes, the Magic Leap device. Um, have you seen the Magic Leap, Matt? Yeah, I had one for a while. I played a little bit with it. Yeah? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I like it. I, I'm not much into the virtual reality sort of thing. Okay. Um, but, uh, yeah, I can see where these things are going, and they, I, I'm super excited. Yeah, definitely something to be said about being hands-free when you're driving or, or you're working somewhere, you know, doing something physical, and, you, and to have that additional bit of information is extremely handy. John Droloon, yes, Google Glass, same type thing, except, uh, yeah... <laughs> yeah, you should see, like, you know, I, we made, we talk about General Lanier, right? One of his books, uh, I think, is one that's called The Dawn of New Everything. Mm. Uh, there is a chapter, I think it's an appendix. Okay. Maybe appendix two, where he talks about the future of software. Okay. And he describes this virtual reality where every software is a humanoid. It's shaped like a human. And on the back of that software, of, of that humanoid, is the actual screen with the code. Oh, wow. And, and, and he says, you know, like it's the UI of the software is, is on the back. And, and he describes that in a way to say there will be a future where software will interact with other software via UIs, like we interact with software. Like if you think about how you can train a machine learning to play a video game, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. Just look at the pixels on the screen and they can play the video game, right? It's, it's AI playing with a video game like if it was a human interacting with software. So he describes, okay, imagine this future where all software interacts one with one another uh, like humans do. And yeah. there's basically no distinction, right? And suddenly, you're not building APIs anymore. 
right? All you have to do is having software talking one to another, you know? Imagine if my voice assistant calls your voice assistant via phone, right? Right. There's no API anymore. Now they can agree on booking some calendar for us, right? Uh, so, so it's interesting how he, he connects the virtual reality with software development uh, to come up with his ideas. It, it's, it reminds me of the movie Tron, right? And, and right, Tron Legacy, where... Right, the various applications were folks walking around in in the gaming grid. Right. Yeah, definitely something to be said about that. Um, very cool. Well, thank you so much for joining me today, Matt. I am peeking around here to see if there's someone we can raid as we wrap up here. You know what? Um, I think I think our friends on the Visual Studio channel are getting ready for a for a show in just a little bit. I think we'll just wrap up here. Th thanks so much, Matt. I, I really do appreciate you joining us. Um, we'll archive this video off. It'll be available on YouTube a little bit later. And uh, we're going to set up. I, I don't have a guest scheduled for next week yet. I'm working on that. I want to I try and bring somebody in from the debugger team to talk to us about building a debugger and working with some of that technology. Do a little bit more hands-on. So... Um, thank you, chat room. Yeah, D.D. Walsh has great conversation. Cheers. Absolutely. Um, th this was a tremendous access great, access, great insight into some of these things we should be thinking about around security and ethics of our IoT devices and how we should interact better with those things. Very cool. cool. Thank you, everyone. Was All awesome. right. Thanks so much, everybody. We'll, um, I'll be back tomorrow. We'll be writing some more code, and uh, we'll talk to you then. So let me, there it is. All righty, take care, everybody.